أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور أرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد قوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم تراهم ركعا سجدا يبتغون فضلا من الله ورضوانا سيماهم في وجوههم من أثر السجود ذلك مثلهم في التوراة ومثلهم في الإنجيل كزرع أخرج شطعه فآزره فاستغلظ فاستوى على سوق يعجب الزراع ليغيظ بهم الكفار وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات منهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his blessed name for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us this existence an existence that is rich with opportunities it is also ugly in many ways but that's what makes opportunities possible it's the ugliness of life that makes opportunities possible the infinite mercy of Allah would not have allowed such nasty qualities of life such as treachery murder theft lying cheating all such things to exist had it not been for a divine purpose which is to enable the creation which is you and I to struggle progressively and proactively towards a higher existence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have created us had we been designed to fail if failure is innate in us it defies the mercy of Allah for us to exist it defies it and we can recognize this defiance from all the creations that Allah has made even those that are subservient to us such as the insects such as the animals that we use to our benefit you will notice that even they have not been left without guidance they have not been left without survival instincts they have not been left without some guarantee that they will be of comfort in their own existence now you and I know as intelligent beings that our ability to go in two direction meaning the good direction or the wrong direction Allah says uh, that there is two guidances there are two pathways the good path and the bad path alam naj'al lahu aynayni wa lisanan wa shafatayn wa hadaynahu najidayn right we gave us the lips the tongue the eyes and two pathways najidayn these two pathways Allah says you are capable of deciphering wrong from right because the nafs which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has perfected wa nafsin wa ma sawwa fa alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwa he has taught it what is wrong and what is right as intelligent beings therefore it is very critical for us to recognize that the main objective and purpose of our existence on this earth which is very transient because even if we live to be 100 years old it is nothing in the scope of time we know the earth is four and a half billion years old. We know the universe is more than 12 billion years old. In the, in the state of billions of years and in the state of time, a hundred years is a speck in time. It is nothing but a bleep on a radar screen and it disappears. And you and I are living that bleep. That's it. This whole discussion is that bleep. And you and I have to come as intelligent beings with a decision in life that what is my purpose in this life? Why am I created? I must recognize that there is good. And I have recognized that my whole biological system is built 
that if I indulge in good things, even my body reacts in a good way. That if I avoid evil deeds, my life becomes good and the surrounding becomes good and people become happy and treachery reduces if we not eliminate it. Look, it's logical. We all know this. It's logical. The irony is, as much as we know it, we are so confused in not knowing which pathway to take that will, that will in, in fact increase the potential of what I'm discussing. Meaning we all agree that we are under the enormous mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all agree that we are highly endowed. We all agree that we are blessed to achieve higher existences. We all agree rationally, rationally, I will tell you, that a wise person thinks long term. We all agree. A fool only thinks of short term. But a wise person thinks of long term and takes the short term into consideration. Meaning I will worry about short term, but I'm concerned about long term. We agree? No one can defy that. Then is it not rational to say, what is long term? If I live to be 100 years, that's long term to me? If I live to be 50 years, that's long term to me? What is long term? The only rational argument that one can give that positively answers this rationality is that long term must be infinite. You love this world, but the hereafter is better and it is eternal. Look what Allah is saying in the Quran. It is eternal. So be rational, Allah says. Be rational for yourselves. Be logical. Are you going to give up? the eternity of your potentials for a short period of time of pleasures. Now no one says that the believer should not have pleasure in the world. It's a misconception in saying that if I want the hereafter, I must suffer in this world and cause all kinds of damnations on myself. No, that's not true. Allah has not built such a system. Allah has built a system where you and I can guarantee pleasure in this world and in the hereafter. What do we say? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. وَفِي hasana. Hasana both ways. Dunya hasana. Akhirati hasana. Fakina adab nar. And keep me away from the fire of hell. Why? Why fakina adab nar? Because we are already designed to go to paradise. Hence, it is our misdeeds that's going to take us to hell. And therefore, in the dua in the Quran, Allah says, and therefore, Allah, keep me away from fire because that's my deed that's going to take me there. Because by decree, the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great that all of us have been created to be into paradise. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My brothers and sisters, I greet you with salams and salamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I send condolences to the believers on earth and to humanity for the momentous sacrifice given by the grandson of the Holy Prophet Hussein ibn Ali wassalam, on the 10th of Muharram, 61 years after the messenger left Mecca to migrate to Medina. And we find that this event of Karbala is the most momentous and poignant in history, more than any tragedy that ever happened in history for certain reasons. People might say, families have been massacred before in history. What makes this one so important? I agree. We should ask such questions. And why is it that we as Muslims, particularly the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, reiterate the history of Karbala systematically each year, and why is it that we lament and we mourn? And why do we put on black garbs as a sign of sadness? What is so important about this? Tonight, I would like to introduce that subject. Particularly, I want to face, as you know, the subject of these presentations here at the Islamic Center is the Karbala in the Quran. And you might say, yes, after all, the Quran is the guidance from Allah. It is an inimitable book meaning no human being has been able to copy it. It is a perfect book, a complete book. It is the only book where God is the exclusive author from cover to cover. There is no other scripture on earth where God is talking himself. Every other religious book on earth, a human being claims that God spoke to him. 
But in the Quran, there is no claiming. Even the Messenger of Allah in the entire Quran does not utter a word of his own. Qul la as'alukum ali. Qul say, qala. He said, and he said. Who's talking? Only Allah. So the Quran should be the best source to validate these questions. That why is it important that we lament? What makes it so momentous? People would argue that isn't Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad the most important person? Hands down. Any human being who dare as a Muslim says that there is anyone better than the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes outside the fold of Islam, is no longer within the fold of Islam. Because Allah said, كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, your best role model to you is the Messenger of Allah. فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا There is no question about it. These events, by the grace of Allah, by the mercy of Allah, which were performed by the reflectors, and I repeat, reflectors, not deflectors, reflectors of the Messenger of Allah by the command of Allah in the Quran have brought forth further evidence that the Messenger of Allah is the only one that should be followed. Hence these events of Karbala and Imam Hussain going to Karbala and meeting the enemy on the front line was to prove this point. That there is nobody more important to follow and to obey than Allah and His Messenger. And that third group in the Quran is proof positive that there has to be a reflector. A reflector meaning when I pose a question, there has to be someone who takes me to the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a deflector. Not someone who says the Messenger supposedly may have said and then tells me half a story. No. Because now I'm getting half a religion. And at the end of the day, the rational mind says, I need the complete religion. Then what I do with it is my choice. So that on judgment day, I can say to Allah, you gave me the complete guidance. And now any misguidance is due to my own self. It's very important. So what does the Quran say? And this is why the focus will be inshallah on the Quran. I will emphasize historical events too. But not too deep. Because I think the essence is that we must extract these events to take us closer to Allah and His Messenger. Allah on numerous occasions in the Quran consistently has maintained one powerful theme, which is Tawheed and obedience to the Messenger of Allah. In Surah Hujurat, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yidaillahi wa rasooli wa attaqullah. O you who believe, do not go ahead of Allah and His Messenger. لَا تُقَدِّمُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ Why? Because Allah says, your guidance is only Allah and His Messenger. And whatever they give you, what Allah gives you and His Messenger gives you, you must obey. Now you might ask, why? Let me give a little footnote. People ask, what's the purpose of religion? Brothers and sisters, people talk about science as being the guiding light for us today. Science does not have any moral prescriptions. I'm going to repeat it. I want it to be recorded in the world. Let it be quoted a thousand times. Science does not have any moral prescriptions, brothers and sisters. Science is a necessary tool. It's a very important tool. But it lacks any moral prescriptions of do's and don'ts in terms of good and evil. So then how am I going to behave? I may know how things work and I can build great structures because science has enabled me to see that. But what about my character? What about my qualities? What about my halal and the haram, the do's and the don'ts? What should I eat and not eat that is good for me and bad for me? Science cannot answer fully on that. It can give me some examples of harm and not harm. But what about the moral prescriptions? What about patience? What about subservience? What about prayer to a higher deity? What about hope? What does science have to give me about hope? Nothing. So we are in need of guidance. No human being 
can dare say that that instrument will guide me. We are in need of guidance. So when we talk about religion, it's a fixed system. Somebody asked me recently in Colorado, an atheist, a mathematician. He and I were having a discussion for about an hour and a half. And he asked me this question. He says, in science, we have a fixed system. I said, correct. That's what makes science viable. Because if the scientific systems fluctuated, then all my measurements are useless. The universe, we understand, fixed laws of the universe are fixed. So you as a scientist, and a Russian as a scientist, and a German as a scientist, and a Chinese as a scientist, and African as a scientist, they all go and observe the universe, they'll come up with similar answers because the system is fixed. This is how Allah does it. It's His mercy. Imagine if the systems of science constantly change. It would be madness. You and I would not even know who we are. One minute you're floating, next minute you're hitting the ground hard. Next, next thing, you know, you're falling sideways. It would be madness. Allah says, look. Don't you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made, أَلَمْ تَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَأَصْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنًا Look at the ni'mah Allah has given you. Look at how He has fixed the system so that you can now stand in front of the world and say, I'm a scientist and I discovered such and such and then you, give, you get Nobel Peace Prizes and you're called a genius. The whole system of ingenuity had to be fixed. Otherwise, where is your ingenuity? It's nothing. Subhanallah. So when this person is asking me that question, I said, you are correct. So he looks at me, he says, religion, I have a problem. It's not fixed. I said, you are right based on what you have experienced, but I'll show you something that is why religion is so important. He says, go ahead. I said, my Lord God is the one who made everything fixed. And the moral prescription in the true religion of God also has to be fixed. فطرت الله التي فطر الناس عليها لا تبديل لخلق الله. The system of Allah is fixed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fixed. He doesn't change. Allah's system doesn't change over time. His morals don't change. If I tell you what Adam was prescribed and what his children were prescribed and his generations were prescribed, show me when in the Quran did Allah change that system. So the fixing is only possible if we attach ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah in the Quran says, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله Don't go ahead of Allah and His Messenger. That's your fixed system. You will never be left alone by them. They will never abandon you. And you can put total trust in them that whatever they give you or don't give you, it is good for you. Subhanallah. Look at the mercy. Look at the balance now. I've got my material balance by being a scientist and I've got my spirituality balanced by looking at the right deen. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us this mercy, this rahmah. That we have to look at it carefully in order to save our akhirah and to, be ple to have happiness in dunya also. This shahada of Imam Hussein is of the highest caliber because it reflects this perfectness of the religion. It gives me consolation and it gives me stability. It gives me strength and vision and it guarantees my future. So historically what had happened, and study all histories, you will see religions were all brought, all major religions, if you study them, prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were involved in bringing them. The psyche of the human race has never been left alone by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be guided with. Messengers, according to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was 124,000 of them. In every city, Allah said, Every community has been guided. We never sent prophets except with the language of their, their people. So that they can explain to them. Guidance has come to all of mankind. North, south, east, west, the entire earth has been managed by prophets. And those great religions all had the quality of perfectness and clarity in it.
But humans intervened into it, subtracted and added their whimsical ideas, and today we are victims of history, left to wonder whether God is really talking to us or somebody who has an ulterior motive is talking to us. This is the problem. Thousands of religions exist. People ask me, why are there so many religions? Shouldn't God just have brought one religion? Yes, in Nadina in Allah al Islam. To Allah, there is only one religion, Al Islam, the submission, the submission, the religion of peace, the one that promotes peace, not one that goes and kills and takes the rights of anyone. Anyone. Maintain the balance, don't cheat it. Allah says, Hold upright with balance. This is the religion of Allah. Never has the Quran ever allowed his believers ever to harm an individual. Allah does not do dhulam, does not do injustice to a human being. None, shay'an, mankind does it on themselves. Why? Because our ego, our self-centeredness, our ignorance, our short-term thinking, our passionate desires of the world blurs the true mission of why we live. So let me give a quick tafsir of this so I can give it uh, due justice. I started from Surah Al-Fatih, the 48th chapter, one of the last verses, number 28. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the following, because now we're going to discuss the Qur'an. We're going to show that this event of Karbala is so monumental. If we take it outside the picture, and if we turn a blind eye to the history of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid for us, guaranteed we, we, we would be like all the rest of the other religions, left with shells to wonder where the truth is. There'd be a blurred line. You wouldn't even know what is haq from batil. You wouldn't know where the truth lies, where false is. Look, I read other books. I see it. I see truth there. But it's so blurred with lies. I said, wow, that people are so fooled, thinking this is the religion of God. And then when you talk to them and say, look, it's so clear. There's a violation here. They said, yeah, but God must have intended this. I said, what God do you worship that will allow you to be so confused? What God is this that misguides? What God is this that blurs our vision so much and then demands from us good quality and good behavior? What God is this? What God sends His representatives who commit crimes? What God would send a representative who tells us to cheat and lie and kills himself in the name of God and then tells us you be good? What nonsense is this? This is violating my very inner core of my very essence of my humanity. It can't be. That's the argument. That the tragedy of Karbala was epic at the highest level. For on the other side was a man by the name of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. And Yazid ibn Muawiyah was the son of Muawiyah, who is the son of Abu Sufyan, who is really the son of Hind. As you know, Hind, his mother, is that famous liver-eating woman who ate the liver of Hamza. Put this into perspective now. We're not talking about a fairy tale here. This is so blatantly black and white that you and I have to make a choice that today in academia, if non-Muslims are asking us, validate your religion, you and I have to bring evidence forward to say, my religion is the best. Say to them, bring your proof. If I bring such proof in saying, yes, my representatives who took the helm of power in religion, which the Messenger of Allah left for mankind to choose between themselves, which led to this kind of treachery, which is okay, because religion is still important, they'd be laughing at us. They'll say, you are foolish people. You are going to accept such a religion that is so violated, that is so broken, that is so contradictory, and you're going to hold on to it? Are you okay? You know people who become atheists? Majority of them, why did they become atheists? Study the analysis, you will see. The majority of atheists were theists. Majority of people who rejected Allah, who reject Allah today in the world, ask them. 
How did you become an atheist? He says, I was a Christian before. I was a Jew before. I was a Hindu before. Ask them. Even some who have become atheists from Islam. Why? Confusion. Because they cannot reconcile. They're hearing stories. They say, I can't believe this. You want me to worship this? What nonsense is this? I'm safer just rejecting God. I'm safer because it's a contradiction to me. At the end of the day, I have to be a moral human being. What is this? This can't guide me. This is the argument. You find Imam Hussain is showing. See, what happened is, very quick history, just to give you the essence, inshallah tomorrow we'll discuss further. Just a simple essence, feel this. The Messenger of Allah came, delivered the greatest religion, finished it. By the way, Islam did not come 14 centuries ago. Islam was completed 14 centuries ago. Please, I say this please to all of us, especially my young brothers and sisters who are in academic institutions. When anyone says to us that among the Abrahamic religions, Islam is the youngest religion, raise your hand and say, I would like to correct that. Islam is the original religion. It was completed 14 centuries ago. It didn't start 14 centuries ago. So don't tell me it is the youngest. It is the original. There's a difference, huge difference, because there's an implied connotation that the Messenger of Allah concocted a religion. And we must not accept that poison pill. So here, what happened? The Messenger delivers the most critical part, which is why all of this is exemplified. And I'll discuss further from the Quran why it is so essential to do dhikr of Karbala, dhikr of Imam Hussein in his shahada from the Quran. Proof positive. And if you understand it, you will see, subhanAllah, it is so powerful. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us obedience to Allah, His Messenger, and those vested with authority. The, the, last, the last group, wa ulil amri minkum. Those, I will discuss it from the Quran, you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed them in a very strategic position and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us in the Quran to the Messenger, Ya yuhar rasul ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik wa in lam taf'al fama ballagta risalatah wallahu ya'simuka min nas Notice, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, deliver what has been commanded of you and if you don't, you haven't delivered this message. The last year of the Prophet's life, what is he supposed to deliver? That if he doesn't deliver, he has not delivered this entire message of 23 years. It's the appointment. The appointment, the ulil amr. Who is your ulil amr? Who's the one that's going to close the gate? Who's the one that's going to make sure no human being intervenes and adds his two cents worth so that you and I are left with confusion like other religions? That's why Allah says, Wallahi asimuka min nas God will protect you from mankind because this appointment is going to raise a lot of red flags and there's going to be so much animosity, so much bloodshed that look around us that the history of Ahlul Bayt from the Messenger's time onward has been nothing but our Imams have been persecuted, killed, Ahlul Bayt members have been killed, even the Shia have been killed and especially the family of the Prophet were chased after even up to Europe. Why? Because Allah says, this is that closing gate. When the Messenger said, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun Babuha, I am the city of knowledge. And Ali is its gate. He's telling us that the security is formed. It's closed. You can't put your two cents worth in anymore. Because the gate is there. The city is not exposed. Wa Aliyun Babuha. Look at the essence. This, this, by the way, hadith, the Messenger of Allah is unanimously agreed by all schools of thought. Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun Baba. That appointment establishes a fundamental principle that was going to guarantee us reflections. Historically, what happens? You find Muawiyah comes into power as a governor in Syria. Syria was Christian. When it fell, it came in the hands of the Banu Umayyah from the very beginning. Abu Sufyan's first son took power. He died shortly after. Muawiyah comes into power. So now imagine you and I in Syria. We were just Christians. And now we've become Muslims. And all we're hearing, Islam from whose, from whose mouth? The Bani Umayyah's mouth. And what is the Bani Umayyah's uh, uh, vision? Destroy Ahlul Bayt. Don't bring Ahlul Bayt forward. Destroy them. Why? Because if you can remove the gate... The city is exposed and then attack it. Like all the other religions have done, this is a classic signature of Iblis. 
When Iblis wants to alter a religion, remove the gate, expose the fortress, and then go and attack the, the people. That's how it works. So Muawiyah consistently manufactured hadith against Ahl al-Bayt. And whatever people heard about praises of Ahl al-Bayt, they would replace the names with the people that Muawiyah liked. And today, we have thousands of hadith giving praises to the wrong people. We are victims of history, brothers and sisters. And that is why when Imam Hussein goes to Karbala, he says, I have to go. For there is no way the believers will understand where Haq and Batil is. For if the seat of power has already come into the hands of this very man who is manufacturing religion and confusing the minds of people, that cursing Ahl al-Bayt, especially Imam Ali wasalam, on the pulpit, was a tradition that was guaranteed. That means some of the khutaba who used to come on the pulpit after delivering a lecture and they forgot to curse Imam Ali wasalam, they would come back on the pulpit and recite the curse of Imam Ali wasalam, and then get off the pulpit. Can you imagine this? Who is Imam Ali alayhi salam? The brother of the Prophet, the beloved of the Prophet. No man has been praised after the Prophet in the Quran and in the Sunnah of Rasulullah as Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. No man, historically, and I'm not saying it because I'm a follower of Amir al Mu'mineen, I say it historically. Why do we turn a blind eye to them? Is it not Allah who wants us to follow them? Is it not Allah who has commanded us? Is it not Allah who wants to safeguard our religion? The Bani Umayyah wanted to eradicate that. It's momentous, brothers and sisters. If you and I feel good to be Muslims today, and if you and I feel good that there is guidance for us, and if you and I feel empowered that Allah has guaranteed our religion to be perfect, and guaranteed our religion to be the best guidance, then should we not pay allegiance to what has caused this? I will read tomorrow the story of what Muawiyah said with his own mouth. Mas'udi, in his history, notes what Muawiyah said, what his real intent and mission was as a caliph. Muawiyah's mother was a liver-eating woman. The messenger cried when Hamza's liver was taken out. Not only did she remove his liver, she removed all his organs. The messenger cried and he cried. This woman, her son, mothers, how important are mothers? Look at the Quran. The purity of womanhood is where prophets came from. Best example, Maryam. In Nastafaki wa Taharaki. Purified. That's why Isa alayhi salam is so great. His mother. Can we take leaders today whose mothers are treacherous? Can we even accept them in our religion? I ask us all, this is not a matter of one school versus another. We have to encourage the Muslim ummah to come back to Allah and His Messenger and said, we must obey Allah and His Messenger. And there is only one way that Allah has chosen. And that is the way. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that my Ahl al-Bayt, the Holy Prophet is saying, my Ahl al-Bayt must be followed. Mawadda. This is not the Messenger saying. Allah is saying to the Messenger, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Say, I want no reward for you, from you, O people, except that you have mawadda, mutual love. Mutual. Mawadda. People may say, isn't mawadda just love? We don't have to obey them. Well then, let's go to Surah Al-Imran. Hmm? Allah says, In kuntum tuhibboon Allah, fattabi'uni. Yuhbibkum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. Look, what does Allah say? In kuntum tuhibboon Allah. If you claim to love Allah, to hibboon Allah, what is the condition of love? Look, the Quran is establishing. If you dare to say you love Allah, you can't just say I love and not follow. The condition in the Quran is Surah Al-Imran. In kuntum to hibboon Allah. You claim to love Allah. Fattabi'uni. Allah is saying to the messenger, say, قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ Allah." Say to them, if you claim to love Allah, then obey me. Fattabi'uni. يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Then Allah will love you. Notice the mutuality of love has a direct connection to obedience. اتبع, meaning to follow. فَاتَّبِعُونِي Obey me, follow me. Here the, when Allah says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى I want no reward from you except that you have mawadda. It is completely guided from the essence of mutual love which is total obedience to them. Total obedience. And when we disobey them, we are disobeying Allah. Therefore, it is very evidential 
that those who killed Imam Hussein and his followers and any member who fought any member of Ahlul Bayt chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as divine guidance after the Messenger of Allah has violated the core principles of Islam and they will be considered non-believers as worst of worst, the munafiqeen. There is no greater, no worse individual in the Quran condemned more than a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is the highest form of treachery. Highest form. So look what the Quran is saying, and then I will conclude tonight. In Surah Al Fat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al haqq li yudhiru ala deen kulli wa kafa billahi shahida. Let me translate. He it is who sent his messenger with the guidance and the true religion, deen al haqq, li yudhiru ala deen kulli. To supersede all religions. That's the divine plan of Allah. You and I are living it. Today, this shahad of Imam Hussein is precisely the instrument. This is the instrument. This is the instrument that's going to bring the haq forward. This is the instrument that's going to clarify the blurred areas. This is the instrument that's going to make it clear for you and I, whether we're discussing within our religion or without our religion, meaning outside of our religion, you will find this is the decree. The Quran is the guidance. It guides us. Furqan. The actions of the messenger, Furqan. The actions of Ahlul Bayt, Furqan. We are left with so many excellent tools to guarantee that our religion is solidified. And I will mention, brothers and sisters, that we don't want to solidify religion just to let the rest of the world know that my religion is more solid than yours. No. We want to solidify and have that debate with ourselves. We want to look in the mirror. Forget the world. Look in the mirror and say, I am convinced. Don't even say that to the world. No atheist needs to hear you. No Christian needs to hear you. Because when we act in the prescription of Allah, it will talk by itself. Deeds speak much louder. The actions of Imam Hussein in Karbala, those key 72 warriors speak mountains. They didn't speak much. You notice historically, when we see the, the, the sermons of Imam Hussein, they're profound. Imam Hussein spoke in Arafat, he spoke on the way, all the 14 spots that he stopped, he spoke every place. But if I compile them all, it cannot be equal to his actions. This is the power. You and I, brothers and sisters, need to indulge in actions. We are contradictions. We have social problems. The whole world has social problems. All of us have social problems. Why? Because we give lip service to religion, to deen, thinking that we're going to enter paradise, and then we abandon halfway in the middle of the battle, and we run in the opposite side, thinking it's okay, God will forgive us. This contradiction, we are adding to the blur of the world. When we misbehave and we're not consistent, we're adding to the blur. When a child comes to me and says, I'm confused, I wonder, did I cause that confusion? Maybe my misbehavior led to that confusion. Maybe, so should we be reactive? Or should we be proactive? Look what Allah says. True religion, it's going to supersede. That's a guarantee. And I can see it. Look around the world. Subhanallah. Continue. He says, Allah is enough. Wa kafa billahi shahida. Then the next verse. Muhammadur Rasulullah. Walladina ma'a wa shiddawal al kuffar. Ruhama wa baynahum taram rukkaan sujjadan yabtahuna fadla min Allah wa ridwan. Simaun fi wujuhim min athar is sujood. The Messenger of Allah and those who are with him. They are firm against the disbelievers. Meaning they are not chickens, they don't run away, they don't sell their lives. You see? They are not men who don't sell their religion for a main price. They don't bargain. There is no room to bargain for Allah. We all bargain to some degree. But Alhamdulillah, we have a template on how not to bargain. Allah says, who are they? Those who are with him. Firm against disbelievers. Let me read the English translation real fast so I don't take too much time. He says, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those with him are firm of heart against the unbelievers. Compassionate among themselves. Ruhama wa We're kind to each other. 
gentle. Only when there's iniquity, indecency, we say, no, sorry. Oh, come on, join us. Take a little whiff. It's okay, smoke it. It's good for you. Take a little shot, you know. It's just it'll give you a little buzz. What's the big deal? No. They say, get this away from me. This is shaitan. Firm. And then they're merciful with each other. We protect each other. Somebody's backbiting? She says, excuse me, I can't hear this. لَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْدَكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدَكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِكْتُمُ Don't backbite. You like to eat the flesh of your dead brother? It's disgusting, Allah says. He says, who are they? You will see them bowing down, prostrating themselves, seeking grace from Allah and pleasure. Their marks are on their faces because of the effect of prostration. That is their description in the Torah and their description in the Injil. Like a seed, listen to this analogy, it's brilliant, subhanAllah. Like a seed that produces and puts forth its sprout, this is Quran, then it strengthens it. So it becomes stout, firm, delighting the sowers, delighting that he may enrage the unbelievers on account of them. Allah has promised those among them who believe and do good, forgiveness and a great reward. Tonight, as we know, Imam Hussein alayhi salam is going towards Kufa and they are ready to, people called him half-hearted people. They were a group that were very strong. And brothers and sisters, by the way, when we say people of Kufa invited Imam Hussein, they left them, you know, those are the people of Kufa, you can't trust them. Let's not say that. I often ask myself, if I was in Kufa, where would I be? On whose side would I be? Let's not point fingers at a nation or a people. And say, oh, those people. No, 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 it's easy for us to say that. I'm telling you, historically, our imams and the majority of the time were very minority. They were a minority at all times. Even Imam Ali salam was a minority. So let's not fool ourselves. You find that Imam Hussein, as he's aiming towards guidance, towards a revolution against Muawiyah, towards a revolution to eradicate this destruction pathway that Muawiyah embarked on. You know that Muawiyah, one of his actions was to take this member, this member, which is such a holy institution of the Messenger of Allah. He wanted to move it from Medina to Damascus. You think he cared about this? No. He said, people when they see the member, they remember Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt too much. He wants to destroy it. This is how dangerous Muawiyah was. So you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is showing us, the ones who prostrate, the ones who give their lives, you will see them. In Karbala, look what happens. I will give you a simple introduction tonight and then I end. You find that in Karbala, when Imam Hussein is being massacred on the 10th of, Ash, or the 10th of Muharram on Ashura day, what did he ask the enemies to do? He said, stop, you're attacking us. He looked up, Abu Thamama looked up, and the, Imam Hussein alayhi salam is asking, why are you looking? He says, I'm looking if the prayer time is up. He says, may Allah raise you among the prayerful ones, for you are remembering salah in this most difficult time, O Abu Thamam. Subhanallah. رُكَّعَنْ سُجَّةً يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهُ وَرِضْوَانَ سِيمَاهُمْ فِي أُوجُوهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ You and I, brothers, need to be these kinds of people, worrying about our salah. Then we love Imam Hussein, and on the other side, did they stop? They didn't stop. That means they were not believers. Even the enemy would have shown respect for somebody who wants to pray. Even the enemy would have cared. They didn't care. They kept showering. And they say some of the companions were shielding with arrows, with their hands, and arrows were hitting their eyes and their faces. And while the Imam is leading prayers, up to the extent that they would hold the hand of the Imam by the time they're breathing their lives. And they said, Did we obey you, O Imam? Did we obey you? La wa rasuli. Brothers and sisters, the shahada of Imam Hussein is the shahada of Rasulullah. I say it concretely and I will prove it from Quran. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll discuss this further. You find that the messenger clearly said, Hussein minni wa ana min al Hussein. Hussein is from me, and I am from Hussein. And I say, Subhanallah, why did the Prophet say that? Because he wants to make it very evidential 
that if you touch him or his family, you have touched the Prophet. He said, Lahmahum lahmi wa damuhum dami. Ana harbun liman harabahum wa silmun liman salam. I make war with those who make war with him. I make peace with those who make peace with him. That means the messenger was at war with Yazid. As Muslims, let's articulate it this way. Let's articulate it very clearly that Imam Hussain was at war by the representation of the Messenger of Allah. Why did the Prophet say, Wa ana min al Hussein? You might say, physically, being born from the flesh of the Messenger of Allah, you can say, Hussein no minni. Why would you say, Wa ana min al Hussein? If you look deep, you will see that Imam Hussain is the one who has kept the Messenger alive. When Allah says, Wa rafa'na laka dhikrak. That rafa'na like a dhikrak had to come at the hands of a sacrifice. That's why probably the Prophet said, Wa ana min al Hussein, ala la'anatullahi la al-qawm al-zalimin, wa say'alamu al-ladhina dhalamu ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.